Hi. So, sorry I'm late. I had to walk the dog. It's, it's, it's the dog's world. We just, I just walk a minute. Um, this is just, uh, <laughs> I know this should have been after, after Dino's talk. Where's Dino? Ah, there you are, yes. Uh, would have kind of tied in a little bit, but uh, anyway, this is just real, actually just another one of my, how I spend part of my summer vacation talks. Um, so you might remember a couple, a couple of years ago I presented, I uh, spent some time in southern Alberta with uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues who I did my master's with, uh, Nick Campioni. Um, he was doing some work with uh, David Evans from the ROM. Um, but there's actually another dinosaur project in Alberta, and they used to call it the Northern Alberta Dinosaur Project, and that didn't sound cool enough, so now it's the, the Boreal Alberta Dinosaur Project. And it kind of started off with really no budget at all, just uh, three guys who had an interest in the area. Um, the fellow in the middle, uh, Federico Fanti, is a, a geologist from, from Italy, and he did his PhD on uh, the uh, stratigraphy of this, of this particular area that we're going to talk about. Um, and then he got involved with, uh, with Nick, uh, my former uh, classmate, and uh, Matt Vavrick, who's also, uh, who has worked at the ROM. So there's a ROM connection with all these people, um, but also an interest in the particular uh, uh, fauna that are found in, uh, in northern Alberta. And they've been kind of poking around with really no budget for a few years now. But um, last year, uh, another you know, uh, ROM colleague, Rice Lab, uh, from uh, Mississauga, uh, colleague Corwin Sullivan, who had been working in China for a number of years, uh, he now has a, a faculty position at the University of Alberta in, uh, in Edmonton, which means he has money. Um, so he's now the fourth kind of uh, person on this uh, uh, project, and he's helped to provide some funding so that we could have an extended uh, field season. Um, so field work in this, in this kind of regard, it's something that, you know, if anyone is interested in this, after seeing this, or maybe you won't be, um, but <laughs> that usually it takes place about, for about a month in, uh, in Alberta, and they welcome volunteers. You don't have to have any previous experience in paleontology, because um, it's not all just analyzing fossils and rocks. Uh, it's also, you know, carrying things and cooking and all these other things. So hands are always welcome. You just need to get there. So the funding that comes into this project helps to pay for uh, supporting the team in the field and any resources that they need. So um, if anyone's interested in doing field work, um, I will probably go out to uh, Alberta again next year. Um, this is one of the, uh, the regal uh, you know, views of, of Grand Prairie, Alberta. Is anyone from northern Alberta? Oh, okay. Where, where are you from? Oh, well, my mom worked in Grand Prairie for two years. Oh, okay. Oh, so you've been to Grand Prairie. Yeah. All right, well, sorry if I'm... <laughs> Um, that's its tall building you see in the middle there. Uh, <laughs> everything else just like three and four stories at the, at the tallest. Um, has the highest crime rate in Canada, uh, apparently because of all the uh, people who are working in the resources industry that are now out of work because of the uh, uh, depression of that industry in Alberta. And uh, unlike other cities in Canada, instead of a Tim Hortons or a coffee shop in every other corner, there's a liquor store in every other corner. And they're open until 11 or even midnight, so uh, it's very interesting. Um, so, last, previously I presented about some work that was being done here in southern Alberta, and that's the kind of area most people are familiar with, with regards to where dinosaur fossils are coming from. Um, but the, the Boreal Alberta Dinosaur Project is, is taking place up in this area, north, uh, north of the province, around uh, Grand Prairie. And that's because Grand Prairie is in a good spot. Uh, it's in this particular rock formation called the Wapiti Formation, which is a series of sandstones interlaced with coal from the uh, late Cretaceous, so late you know, 70 to 80 million years ago, roughly. And um, uh, some of the most interesting finds that have come from there, um, uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry, I just put all these together last night. So, so this is where Grand Prairie is now, uh, at the present, in, in Canada. Um, but um, uh, back in the early Cretaceous, a, a fault line started to develop in, in the middle of North America there, uh, and that formed this big western interior seaway. Uh, and that persisted for millions of years. So while the, the southern Alberta sites were, are sort of of a coastal nature, um, the northern Alberta sites were further inland, so they represent a different kind of uh, fauna and ecology, which is why it's, it's been so interesting for paleontologists to, uh, to explore, but it's a little bit underexplored. Um, in the, in the early 70s, a school teacher found some, uh, some dinosaur bones near a place called Pipestone Creek, and he kept going back, and after a while, they literally found thousands and thousands of bones, over 100 skulls of a particular type of dinosaur called a pachyrhinosaur. Um, and uh, some paleontologists colorfully call that the, the, the Pipe Bed Creek Massacre bone bed. Uh, it's probably one of those scenes where a giant herd of these 
big herbivores were crossing some rapid water. Maybe they were being chased by one of Dino's friends, the uh, Tyrannosaurus of some kind. <laughs> And, uh, and they got into trouble, and many of them died. They were uh, trampled, they were washed downstream, and then the remains were picked over by other large and small uh, carnivores. So it's a really huge uh, 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 bone bed to be explored. Uh, this is in the Philip J. Curry Museum, which is just outside of Grand Prairie. Um, there are also some other uh, herb herbivorous dinosaurs, a lot of hadrosaurs, the northernmost hadrosaurs that have been found. Um, as well as some examples, they've, they've only found a, a T-Rex tooth and a, and a, a one leg bone. Uh, but there's probably going to be more of that. Um, so there's still a lot of stuff they don't know, and, and we don't know about the, uh, the, the fauna of that region. So other differences between the southern Alberta sites and the northern Alberta site. In southern Alberta, you, just, you practically trip over you know, fossil material in those badlands where they're all eroding out. In fact, if you're not careful, you, you'll get, you know, hit yourself in the head if you're walking carelessly. Um, the fossils find you. Um, whereas in the north, um, it's not all exposed, like the Badlands in southern Alberta, so the only way you can find things is by prospecting along the, uh, the, uh, the canyons of streams and rivers uh, in the area. Uh, this is Red Willow Creek, where we also visited. Um, another difference is, in southern Alberta, your accommodations are that deluxe. It's, uh, you're staying in a farmer's field, there's an outhouse, outdoor showers, and things like that. Um, whereas, because we're based in Grand Prairie, uh, we got to use some of the dormitories in the Grand Prairie Regional College. This might be an incentive if you're thinking about field work, but don't want to, not into the camping thing. Um, so it's a very civilized uh, stay. We had nice rooms, we could cook, uh, places to hang out, liquor store at the corner. Um, so in the evenings, we could, you know, talk about what we had found, all the things that had been collected during the day uh, were uh, kind of being wrapped up and so on. So it was a much easier kind of circumstance. I was introduced to the concept of, uh, of shower beer. So when you come back, you want a shower, but you want to have a beer, so you have a beer and you drink it in the shower. Um, this is a picture I was really lucky to take as I flew out of uh, Grand Prairie. We flew over the Wapiti River where we had been working or where the crew had been working for the past month. Um, so this is sort of, north is in this direction, and this is the Wapiti River. Um, and the way to get down to the river is we could park our car here, and there was a, a big power line uh, north-south power line there, so we could kind of walk down the, uh, the cut through in the trees to get to the, uh, to get to the riverbed. Um, so the crew had been working at this site for a, a month already, and this is an, an area that had already been known to have fossils in it. Uh, other, other hadrosaur fossils had been found here. People uh, just paddling down the river in a canoe stopped and they saw something and that became one of the first hadrosaurs that was located there. So they knew where there were more, there were more fossils here in this particular uh, bed. Um, uh, this was a, uh, actually, Dino, you have to close your eyes because you're not allowed to, to, to see this. This is a, a Lambiosaur skull that they found at that locality. It hasn't been, hasn't been described yet or publicized yet, um, so you're the only person who'd be interested in doing that. So, um, so there's, you can see there's the outline of a skull there. So they're very excited. The first Lambiosaurian, another type of hadrosaur, um, found, um, found in this locality. We just don't, they don't know what it is yet. It'll take quite a while to uh, extract it from that lump of rock. So um, on my first day, I got to carry down the 50-pound bag of plaster uh, down the hill that was needed to make the plaster jacket that would uh, cover the rock that was still there that they wanted to bring back, which might still have other parts of that lambiosaur in it. Um, so we're kind of scrambling down this steep, uh, steep river bank after coming down the, uh, the power line cut through the woods. Um, we had to carry down every day uh, gasoline and a generator and, uh, and some uh, power cords so we could use power tools down there. Um, so this is their first, you know, first morning at the, uh, on the Wapiti River. The nice thing about, about being next to a river, uh, one thing is that when you're mixing plaster, you need water. So if you're in southern Alberta, you have to carry jugs of water out with you as well. But here we didn't have to do that. Um, so this was, the, this was the block that that skull came out of, and so we, they've already kind of prepared around it. And now we have to figure out how to get that out of there. Uh, so the first step was putting a plaster jacket uh, around the top of it, a, a thick coat of plaster and burlap, and they embedded some ropes in it to help, you know, hopefully we'd be able to pick it up somehow. Um, so it was the first few days, it was really nice weather, and it was kind of hot. Again, we had water to mix plaster with, and then if you wanted to go swimming, you could, could just go in the river, and you'd dry off in about, you know, 20 minutes. Um, the next day we went back, uh, a lot of smoke from the wildfires in, in British Columbia had come over the Rockies. So it was a very weird kind of gray day. Everything smelled like a wood fire. Uh, that was as bright as the sun ever got. You could look at it and, you know. Um, so we finally had uh, a nice uh, thick jacket prepared 
uh, with those ropes in it and extra layers of plaster. And now we needed to carve away at the base of that, this little pedestal, so we could flip it over uh, in order to uh, move it away. Uh, so we spent the morning just banging away at the rock. It's very hard uh, uh, sandstone. We had some power tools. Um, oh, yeah, we're the, oh, yeah, the sound. Let's see if that works. Um, so this was, let's see. I forgot to check the sound. Let's see if this works. Ah, oh, yeah. So we chipped away at the base, and then we kept tugging on it. We didn't want to break the fossil, but we managed to push it over. And then, and then we had to get rid of the extra rock to make it as small as possible, because we still didn't know how we were going to get it out of there. Uh, there, was no, you know, there was no way of carrying it up the hill, this, you know, three or 400 pounds of rock. And we were thinking maybe we'd be able to get a boat on the river, which is very shallow. Uh, but we had to make the rock as thin and as light as possible. Uh, so this is the sort of work at banging away. And you can see it's, it's not a very easy rock to, uh, uh, to work with. It's, it's really like concrete. Um, So eventually we, uh, we got it thinned down enough and another plaster jacket was put on the other side and they, they put some sticks in it just to strengthen it a little bit so it wouldn't crack in case it got lifted and, uh, and, the, and the rock was a bit weak. Um, and then we had to camouflage it because it is on the riverbank and there, you know, pleasure, you know, people can buy motorboats and canoes and things and there are instances already where people have started preparing fossils in, in riverbanks like this and left a nice white plaster jacket lined the shore and then people will see it from boats and come in and try to take it or, or, or break it open. So, uh, so we had to hide it until we could figure out how to get it out of there. Um, so while we were thinking about that, we went on another trip uh, closer to BC. Uh, this is Red, uh, Red Willow Creek, where there, uh, the, some of the first hadrosaurs were found by Federico Fanti, who's there on the right. Um, another kind of steep climb. There were actually ropes on the trees so we could uh, climb up and down without rolling all the way down the hill. And we spent uh, a couple of days just prospecting uh, along the river. And this is only an hour out of Grand Prairie. So we'd get up in the morning, have breakfast, drive there, have these nice walks through this lovely canyon, looking for fossils, and then go back and have shower beer. <laughs> Here's a piece of uh, fossilized uh, or mummified, they call it a mummified uh, hadrosaur skin, a bit of skin texture. Uh, luckily, we brought along our handy rock saw so we could chop it out of that piece of rock. I got to carry that back up the hill. Um, here's a, a fossil tree, there's a, a sort of a carbon log there, and the rest of the tree is in a layer here. So we also took a chunk of that back, and uh, they're going to try to uh, section it really thin and see if they can see tree rings in the carbon. Um, uh, the best way to prospect along the Wapiti River is in a canoe, where you can go slowly and look at things. So, uh, so one particular afternoon, Federico and a couple of the other crew had a, borrowed a, a rickety, leaky canoe from somebody, and uh, uh, went up and down the, uh, the river. I went back to the original site and banged on some rocks for a little bit, and I found the only thing that I found, uh, which were leaves. Um, so it's just a nice slab. I split it open, and these nice fossilized leaves were in there. And these are actually useful, too. These are going to be turned over to a paleo, uh, paleobotanist, uh, which will also tell them a little bit more about the, uh, the flora and the ecology of this, uh, of this region. Um, the last day, or the next to last day, we went back to the... Uh, uh, Red Willow uh, Canyon to look for some uh, footprints. There are a number of uh, fossil f uh, footprints along the, the riverbank here. Um, you, this, this is for Dino. It's a big, uh, a big theropod footprint. You can see the big three-toed fossil there. So it might be a Tyrannosaur or one of their relatives. And while we were down there, we got an exciting phone call um, that one of the, Matt Vavrick, one of the three co-conspirators, uh, had somehow charmed a local helicopter pilot into picking up the slab for us. Normally that would have cost about $2,000 to have a helicopter fly over the river, drop a line, and bring that big rock up to the, uh, the parking area. Um, uh, one, one guy offered to do it for half price, but that was still more money than we had in our budget. But uh, Matt met a helicopter pilot who just happened to be going by, <laughs> and he said, oh, I'll stop and pick it up for you. That would be cool. So we went down and put a, a rope net around it, and the helicopter swooped in, and uh, uh, they attached the cord, uh, and uh, up it went. And, uh, and there it was back up in the parking lot. It looked a lot smaller on the truck, kind of embarrassingly small <laughs> in the end. Um, and that was pretty much the, the end of the week. It was just this sort of everything kind of came together at the very end. So we had a big, a big party, and again, because we had dorms, we had a barbecue and all kinds of stuff available. Um, and uh, so uh, this was the crew at the end of the uh, season. But again, many people came and went during the four weeks or five weeks that the, uh, 
the season was on, most of these people are paleontologists or, or, stu or students. Um, one or two people work at museums. Um, and uh, this, is, this is the fellow who arranged the residences for us at the, uh, at the dorm. Uh, this is uh, Corwin and uh, Nick and uh, Federico. And, um, and this is uh, Xu Xing, who's a Chinese paleontologist. Uh, the, the Society of River Paleontology meeting was right after this uh, field work, so everyone was going to stay in Alberta and go to that meeting in Calgary. So um, anyway, so it was just a really great week. And uh, my friend Nick now has a job at the uh, uh, University of New England in South Wales, Australia, but he plans on coming back to Canada every year. He's from Ottawa originally uh, to continue working on this, uh, on this project. So I'll probably go back, and if anyone's interested in, uh, in field work, uh, whether or not it's part of your MRP, um, let me know. Thanks.